Now, interesting enough, the last two weeks, everybody's got a name. We've got Bartimaeus, we've got Zacchaeus, and tonight we've got the unnamed. Every character I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, Jairus, it doesn't have a name. And so I want to go back. We have to go back to set the scene. We're looking at a 24 hour period in Jesus' life. But I've got to go back 12 years. And I wanted to just picture this scene. The other side of Capernaum was a place called the Gedarenes, or the, um, what they call it, the Gedarenes or the Gerasenes, but basically it's an area. Um, and it was, it was basically, there was 10 cities in that area. And it was called the Decapolis, the, the Decapolis, so 10 cities. And one of those cities is where Jesus went um, for, for, for ministry and healing. But I want to, and we're going back 12 years, just like you're doing a movie, 12 years earlier, okay? And so I want to introduce you to a young man, probably in his early teens. And he's heard the truth, he knows the truth, but somehow he gets mixed up in the occult. He gets mixed up in Satan worship, and it's just a little bit by little bit, just as our, our children and our young people today, just starts with just a little thing, could be through music, could be through playing a game, could be watching a movie, mixing with the wrong people, listening to the wrong music. And all these things are happening in this man's life. And before he knew it, Satan had hold of his life. But every year it got worse because he didn't realise that each time he did something, another demon would enter into his life. And so he went from being a normal young teenager to a person that had to live out of the town. And isn't it funny how when people get demonically oppressed, depressed, or they get a, um, a mental illness, often related to demonic activity, what happens to them? They get institutionalised. They get put aside. And so where did they send him? To the graveyard. To the cemetery. And what else did they do? They tied him up, he says, with rope and with chains. Now I know that if I'm being tied up with a chain, if I tied up any of you guys here with rope or with chain, there's not one of you, because there's no Houdini, no one's got a second name of Houdini in this room, not one of you would get out. And yet it said, Every time the spirits oppressed him, he broke his chains and he ran around naked. He had no clothes, chained up. And so every week, this guy was chained up again. And every week he broke his chains. That was his life for years and years and years and years. So that's one character. We're going to plonk him right there. Boom. The next character... Is a guy that we've all heard about, Jairus and his wife. And they have a, a fantastic occasion where they have a baby daughter born in Capernaum. And everybody's there celebrating the life of this newborn baby. But while this is happening, there's another lady, probably went to Jairus' church, we don't know. But at that very time when Jairus' daughter was born, she suffered this blood disorder, which meant that every day we've read it. She had a blood discharge. She'd been to the doctors. She'd been to the specialists. Nobody could help her. Nobody. She tried everything. And so what happens back then in those days, it's even worse than it is today. One, you weren't welcome in society, just like this guy that lived in this tomb, tied up with, she, she might as well have been tied up in the chain because she wasn't, no access to the public area, to, the, to, to where she got her food from the markets. No access to the church. She wasn't led into the church because she was unclean, because she had visual blood. And so she did all by herself. And so as Jairus' daughter's growing up, this lady's getting further and further away from society. So we've got the man with the demonic oppression and depression and possession. We've got the lady who's now suffered his blood disorder, and he's going to suffer for another 12 years. And we've got Jairus and his family with his beautiful daughter growing up into a beautiful woman. And so to start the story, as Jesus says to his disciples, they're in Capernaum, let's go to the other side. Now, for most people that's nothing, it's like roughly a 20 kilometre trip. Now Sharon and I, we did a 40 kilometre trip recently in the open ocean, and it was pretty hairy. And at times we wished that Jesus would have come on the water and calmed the sea. But we got there. But on this particular night, seasoned professional fishermen, scared out of their wits, 
not knowing what to do because the waves were buffeting, the wind was buffeting, and it's a bit like today when you go out to sea, there's a northerly, and you think, I can cope with this, and all of a sudden the wind turns. So the waves are still pushing northerly, but the wind's coming southerly, so you're bashing against two sets of waves. And it's just hard work. It's hard, it's tiring, and it's scary. And so where, where's, where's Jesus? He's asleep in the boat, totally oblivious to what's going on, while the, this boat looks like it's going to sink. Looks like the disciples are going to drown. And so the disciples, in despair, they wake up Jesus and say, Jesus, we're going to drown, we're going to die. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes the wind. He says, peace, be still. And that's exactly what happened. From rough seas, white caps, howling wind, dead calm. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a disciple in that boat, that's freaky. That's freaky Friday to me. That's something out of the ordinary. And so they're probably standing there with their mouth open, gobsmacked, thinking, what has happened? Who is this guy? Because it's early on in Jesus' ministry. Who is this guy that can just come the sea? And what they don't realise is when they get ashore, it's going to happen again. Because here is this young man, now probably in his late 20s, still unclothed, still in chains, with demons right through his body, screaming and carrying on. Nobody can control him, nobody. He is totally out of control, living in the tombstones, there for the rest of his life, condemned to die in the tombstones, amongst, amongst the graves. And so Jesus comes along, gets out the boat, and confronts that spirit. And you know what, the, the Bible tells us, or the commentators tell us, that the words that he used to calm the sea, peace, be still, is the same words he used to get rid of the demons. That's the power he had in his words. That's the power he had in the name of Jesus. Jesus calmed the seas, and then he removed the legion of demons that were in his body. A legion can be up to 6,000 soldiers. But we know there was, well, there was 2,000, because there was 2,000 pigs that day that were having a great time, that were probably heading to the pig market in a few years' time, getting fattened, enjoying their life on the seashore. And what they didn't realise, that the demons had made a deal with Jesus, that, can we go to the pigs? Bad, bad deal. Bad mistake, because all the pigs we tell are told in the Bible that they jumped into the water and drowned. So that's where the demons ended up, drowned in the waters. But the interesting thing is about this man's life. This man whose life was ruined, no hope. Everybody had written him off. Jesus had changed his life. Peace, be still. He changed his life. And so here we have a man now in his right mind, totally healed, totally clean, and totally clothed. They found clothes for him. But I love this part of the story when he says to Jesus, I want to come with you. But the Bible tells us, in fact, it's Mark actually says, that Jesus said, no, no, you go to your people. Tell them what's happened to you. Tell them what's happened. And the Bible tells us he went to the, he went to the, the, the capitals. And I'm not sure what that meant, but I've looked it up, it means 10 cities. He went to every city and told his story. He didn't just go to Victor Harbour and Google, he went to every city around and told everybody what Jesus had done for him. And what a story to tell, total transformation in his life. And so the disciples stood with their mouth open thinking, man, he's just calm the sun. He's just cast out a demon out of this guy that we thought was, had no hope. We'd written him off, the world written him off, but Jesus hadn't. And so Jesus says, hey guys, we're hopping back in the boat, let's go back to Capernaum for scones and coffee. But he didn't realise there was more to happen. So back they go, in the boat, this time they made it all okay. And would you believe it, they hop off the boat, and there's Jairus, whose daughter is now 12. But he's got, problem, he's got a major problem. His daughter is dying. And once again, he's been to the doctors. He's been to the physicians. Everybody's told him there is no hope. There is no hope. And so he comes to Jesus, his last hope, and says, Jesus, can you heal my daughter? And Jesus said, yes, let's go. And so off they go on this little journey. Now, I don't know about you as a parent of a 12-year-old that's dying, and as you're pushing through a crowd, you can imagine the Christmas pageant here, 
and you're going the opposite direction, you're pushing through, and every time you see someone, you stop and say hi. And in Jesus' case, every time you stop, was probably to pray for someone, to heal someone, and he's walking through the crowd at a very slow pace, and there's Jairus. All he wants is his daughter healed. And he's probably pretty frustrated. Come on, come on. And he's trying to get to the side. Come on, come on. We need to get to my house. And what happens? We pick up the story of this lady who's now 12 years on. She's probably in the same place she's been for the last six months. She can't go to the market. She can't get clothing. She can't get food. She has to live as a beggar. She can't go to the doctor. She said, don't bother coming. There's nothing we can do. So she's at her wit's end. Fortunately, someone has told her about Jesus. And she knows that her only hope is to find Jesus. But you know what? I love her faith. Because she said, I only have to touch. I don't have to go there and stand at the front of the church and ask for forgiveness and receive a blessing and get a prayer from Jesus. I just have to touch. Because I've seen, I've heard people say that if you touch his garment, you'll be healed. And so she went with that faith pushing through the crowd, and I'm sure there was people elbowing her, pushing her, get away, you smelly, you know. And yet she persevered. Her faith persevered. And she touched Jesus. The moment of touch, something happened in her body. I've felt it before, and you've probably felt it too many of you have been praying for healing, or you're praying for something, and you know something's happened. Jesus knew, his disciples didn't, the crowd didn't, Jesus knew, and she knew something had happened in her life. She touched Jesus. Her faith healed her. And so her next move is to sneak away, as you would. Because she's lived her whole life sneaking away from people, being out of the limelight, not going to church, not going to market, not being part, not going to any festival. She was always in the background. And that was she was doing back into the background. But as she's going, Jesus says, Who touched me? The disciples said, Lord, there's heaps of people touching you. Get alive. Come on. Get going. And Jairus is getting really agitated. Come on. Come on. Who touched me? Now we've got this woman walking away, thinking, uh oh, I'm going to have to tell my story. And she needed to tell her story. So she told Jesus her story. It might have taken five, 10, 15, we don't know, but she told her story. Everything that had happened, the failures, the letdowns, the people that have let her down, the system that have let her down. But when I touched you, Jesus, something happened in my life. Something happened that changed me, that healed me. And I'm so thankful. And so he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go. And she went. And she had a different life. A totally different, transformed life. We continue on. We're walking along. She's gone happy. She's gone off with some of her, hopefully, newfound friends have gone off with her as well. But as we go around the corner into the next street, Jairus' servants come. So, sorry, Jairus. Don't worry, Jesus. He's, your daughter's dead. Jesus heard the conversation. No, she's not. She's not dead. She's asleep. She was dead. We know the Bible tells she was dead. Her heart had stopped beating. But Jesus said, Don't worry, Jairus. Your daughter is only sleeping. And so off they go. And he gets Peter, James and John, gets rid of all the mourners. See, back in those times, it was basically your high mourners. So they wailed, they cried, they really got into it. And they're crying, they're wailing, and you're wailing with them because it's a terrible situation. They've lost their daughter. And Jesus says, you can stop your mourning, she's not dead. And what do they do? They suddenly stop crying and mourning, they start laughing. So they get rid of the renter crowd because they're no good. And so Jesus gets rid of them all, gets rid of Rendy Crown, and he just calls Peter, James, and John, his closest disciples, the parents. And he says to the young girl, Arise. And up she gets. And her breath came back, her life came back. And Peter, James, and John, and the mum and dad, Joris and his wife, saw an incredible miracle that day. Again, three great miracles, you think about it. The man with the demon possession. Not just one demon, but 2,000 demons. Healed, cured. Now he's a missionary right across the garrisons. You've got this lady, 12 years, no hope, 
nothing left in life. Suddenly healed, free to go to the temple, free to worship, free to go to the market, free to start a career again, and free to tell everybody about Jesus, which I know she would have. And then you've got Jairus, a church leader that was probably hooked up with the Pharisees, but all of a sudden he's become a Jesus convert. He's a Jesus person now, and he's put Jesus first. And they've now got their beautiful daughter healed, saying, eating, rent a cow's gone. And we have this situation over 24 hours where Jesus has come to school, he's healed a demoniac, he's healed a lady with a disease that was incurable, and raised someone from the dead. All in 24 hours. Last week in 24 hours, he just touched, well, we don't know how many touched, but we know he touched the kids. He was a changed person. And we were challenged last week, do you know the Zacchaeuses of this world? And we do. We know those prominent people, those people with a name, those people that have got a, um, a character um, deficiency or they've got something in it could be immorality in their life. We don't like them. We don't want to have anything to do with them, but they're an important figure in the community. We don't want anything to do with them. But Jesus did it. We are challenged to reach out to those prominent people with a name in our community. But today we're also challenged to reach out to the unnamed, the people in our community without a name, that have suffered for years, some of them 12 years, 10, 12 years, that have suffered all their life. Their only hope is to find Jesus. And I pray that as we think about the Zacchaeuses of the world, we also think about the unknown people in this world, in this community, that don't ever know. But in Jesus' eyes, they do ever know. And he sees redeemed, he sees restored, he sees healed. We often see failure, hopelessness, no hope. How many people would have written off, I mean I would have written off that guy in the tombs. I've seen him before, I've seen him down at the pub at 11 o'clock at night. Um, emancipated, death warmed up, too much alcohol, too much drugs. Right off, off to Jesus. And how many people have we seen in in hospital, thinking they haven't got long to go, right off. No, God can heal them. And so maybe we need to put ourselves in the shoes of these people today and say, I've been in these situations before. You know, I've been in those situations before. I've had moments in my life where I've really felt, you know, sick. I've had moments in my life where I've had Death sentence placed on me through, through a medical diagnosis. Different things have happened in our lives. And what do we do? We often go, we often panic and go in this. But this story is telling us no, we need to reach out and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. We need to have that faith to push through and just touch his garment and believe that he can heal us. We need to have the faith to believe that Jesus' words have got power. There is power. In the name of Jesus. And there's power through healing, power through salvation. These people's lives were changed. And I pray that as we read these stories and we're encouraged by these stories, that our lives will be changed as well. So we need to think of the Zacchaeuses, to think of the unknown in our community this week. Because they're out there. They need saving and they need prayer and they need healing. Just think of the institutions that we could probably take nine-tenths out of some of our mental institutions if only we have the um, power to believe that Jesus can heal. If he can heal a demoniac in chains, he can heal most people with mental health issues today. And people that go with incurable diseases, Jesus can heal. So I pray that we can be that instrument of peace, we can be those hands and feet for Jesus. So my own courage this week to not only think about the Zacchaeuses, but to also think about the unknown. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a day for Jesus as he touched so many lives. And Lord, last week we looked at a whole day where just one life was changed, although we don't know Zacchaeus' friend, maybe there was more, but one life, you just spent all that time with just one person and we saw a changed life. And yet, Lord, early on in ministry we see you calming the sick, you casting out demons. Healing a person with an incurable disease and raising a young girl from the dead. Lord, Lord give us the, the faith to believe that we can do that as well. We have that same power, that resurrection power in us as Christians, Lord. Help us to believe, Lord, that we have the power to, to 
save people through your word, Lord. And through our touch, through our ministry, through our hands, through our words, and through our actions, Lord. And so, Lord, this week I pray that we can find the Zacchaeuses of the world, those people, those prominent people that probably don't agree with or, or like, and yet, Lord, you've asked us to reach out to them. You've asked, them, asked us to confront them while they're in that tree, Lord, and ask them to come down and to meet with us and spend time with us. And, Lord, we also ask that you help us to find the unnamed, the hurting, the lost, the demon-possessed, and, Lord, to have that power that you've given us to pray and to, to seek healing for those people. And Lord, most importantly, these people found salvation through you. And Lord, that we can be that, that channel of blessing or that instrument of peace and explain the way of salvation through having a relationship with Jesus. So Lord, we, we pray that you can, through your Holy Spirit, really challenge us this week to find those people and to pray for those people in Jesus' name. Amen.